Tips and tricks for endoscopic transpapillary gallbladder drainage. These are our disclosures. Traditionally, percutaneous gallbladder drainage has been the gold standard for the treatment of cholecystitis in patients deemed unfit for surgery. However, this commits the patient to a cumbersome external drain that requires routine exchange and carries risks of migration, infection, permanent fistula formation, and decreased quality of life. Endoscopic transpapillary gallbladder drainage became available in the 1980s after the description of selective cystic duct cannulation. This offers internal, incisionless drainage in patients with a patent cystic duct where endoscopic expertise is available. The transpapillary approach also preserves native anatomy compared to other endoscopic treatment options, including endoscopic ultrasound-guided gallbladder drainage with alumina-posing metal stent. This is felt to be advantageous if future surgical intervention is being considered, although recent data suggest both endoscopic approaches may be suitable. The general steps for endoscopic transpapillary gallbladder drainage are outlined here and include conventional biliary access and sphincterotomy during ERCP, followed by selective cystic duct cannulation, dilation of the common bile duct and cystic duct strictures, and placement of parallel double pigtail plastic stents for definitive management of cholecystitis. In this video, we will outline our general approach to the procedure as well as highlight useful techniques for successful completion. Understanding each individual patient anatomy is the first step. Here we can see the cystic duct easily identified on cholangiogram. With the catheter advanced and bowed to improve angulation, the cystic duct is cannulated, in this case with a 0.035 inch guide wire. As shown here, the use of an angled wire is essential to successful cannulation of the cystic duct and navigation across the spiral valves of Heister and into the gallbladder. Even after the wire is advanced into the gallbladder, forming an adequate loop is essential to maintain access for passage of instruments. A standard sphincterotomy can then be performed followed by dilation of the cystic duct, in this case with a 4mm biliary dilating balloon to treat any high-grade strictures and facilitate stent placement. Particular care should be taken in patients with acalculus cholecystitis who can develop severe strictures in the cystic duct. After dilation, stenting can be performed. There are multiple methods that can be used to estimate stent length. One useful technique involves marking the starting location of a device inserted into the gallbladder followed by withdrawing the device until it exits the papilla in one motion. This distance can then be measured to help determine stent length. After dilation and determination of stent length, a double pigtail plastic stent can then be advanced into the gallbladder. While data suggests a single stent can be adequate to treat patients with cholecystitis, it is our practice to attempt to place two stents in parallel to provide definitive management and prevent reobstruction if one stent were to become occluded. To accomplish this, the prior steps are essentially repeated, with passing a wire into the gallbladder adequate loop formation followed by deployment of the second parallel stent through the cystic duct and into the small bowel. The final fluoroscopic image is shown here. In this case, access to the gallbladder was obtained in a similar fashion to what was previously described. However, instead of deploying a single stent and reaccessing the gallbladder, a cytology brush catheter was advanced over the initial wire and into the gallbladder. The brush could then be removed, then a second wire coiled into the gallbladder so that it now harbored two wires extending across the major papilla. The first plastic pigtail stent can then be advanced and deployed over the initial wire, with the second stent quickly advanced and deployed over the remaining wire, allowing for dual gallbladder drainage without having to reaccess the cystic duct. In this technically challenging case, in a patient with an indwelling uncovered metal stent, selective cannulation was achieved, but deep access to the gallbladder proved challenging. Oftentimes, multiple maneuvers are needed to navigate a cystic duct, which can be significantly strictured in patients with acalculus cholecystitis. This clip shows changes in scope position and advancement of the catheter with significant bowing to achieve optimal force vectors. Once access to the gallbladder was obtained, Dual wires were placed into the gallbladder using the cytology brush catheter system as previously described, followed by deployment of two parallel plastic stents. In this case, reaccessing the gallbladder alongside an existing stent would have been quite challenging. 
After failed cannulation with a .035 inch guide wire, this clip shows successful access after downsizing to a .018 inch guide wire. In these cases, it can be helpful to utilize a cross-platform, small caliber angioplasty balloon to dilate the cystic duct and facilitate further intervention. Other equipment considerations to keep in mind include use of a rotatable catheter system with bowing capabilities, as shown here, as well as using a balloon for anchoring and balloon occlusion of more proximal ducts to facilitate access to a duct of interest like the cystic duct. To utilize the balloon occlusion technique, deep access is obtained to the most easily accessible duct. A second wire is then passed alongside and the catheter advanced. The balloon on the catheter is then inflated to occlude the common hepatic duct, followed by withdrawal of the first wire. Now, on advancement of the wire, the inflated balloon helps direct the wire into the cystic duct. In this case, the cystic duct was identified on fluoroscopy, but cannulation was unsuccessful despite multiple repeated attempts. The decision was then made to proceed with direct peroral cholangioscopy. While this device does add cost to the procedure, it was felt that successful drainage of the gallbladder was critical in this patient with limited alternative options. The cholangioscope was advanced alongside the guide wire until the cystic duct takeoff could be identified distal to the hepatic bifurcation. The cystic duct could then be partially intubated with the cholangioscope. A wire could then be passed under direct visualization. Facilitated by fluoroscopy, the wire could then be advanced through the cystic duct and into the gallbladder. The cholangioscope could then be withdrawn and exchanged for a dilating balloon. Dual wire access is then obtained and two double pigtail plastic stents are placed in parallel. Endoscopic treatment of cholecystitis provides an important alternative to percutaneous drainage. This educational video has highlighted diverse techniques to maximize the likelihood of success from a transpapillary approach. In conclusion, utilizing ERCP fundamentals as well as the techniques described here, endoscopists can safely and effectively perform endoscopic transpapillary gallbladder drainage and treat patients with cholecystitis who are not surgical candidates.